treasure, our mountains, the water, the animals, the birds, everything. That's what our life is as Indian people. When the United States government first created the Flathead Indian Reservation in 1855, the mountains and valleys of what is now Western Montana remained in Indian world where people lived by Indian ways. The sacred falls on the Flathead River were known by the Kootenai word Kutakanuk and by the Salish word Stipemetk. This was the place of the falling waters. Well, of course it was good, but we didn't know it was that good. <laughs> That's, that's, things are good, but you don't realize. But 80 years of assaults on the sovereignty of the people led to the construction of this massive dam by the Montana Power Company. Now the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes are preparing to take over Kerr Dam for the first time. But the question remains, is this dam inherently destructive of the traditional native cultures, or can the tribes use it to help regenerate the way of life it helped destroy? In 1938, this massive dam was completed on the lower Flathead River, near the very center of the Flathead Indian Reservation. It was built by the Montana Power Company with the encouragement and approval of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Montana Power would control the dam and its enormous revenues for the next 50 years, and it was named for the company president, Frank M. Kerr. The company installed bronze plaques proclaiming the dam as a monument to friendly cooperation between Indians and whites. But today, some members of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes have a different idea of what the dam has meant for the people. Well, I think the dam was a symbol, and it was a symbol of the domination of tribal sovereignty. And for some elders, the memory of how things were before the dam calls into question the supposed benefits of its construction. The construction of Kerr Dam was the culmination of an 80-year assault on the traditional cultures and political sovereignty of the Kootenai, Bondaray, and Salish or Flathead people an assault that began with the Treaty of Hellgate in 1855, which established the Flathead Reservation. In the years after the dam's completion, the pace of change and cultural loss only quickened on the Flathead Reservation. World War II in particular deeply affected the already fragmented communities. Since from the time I was small and to the time I, where everything really took change, was when we got in a war with Japanese, Japanese, Pearl Harbor, right after that. Everything changed very fast, very, very fast. You don't go up, and get, go up there and, and dig, dig bitter root, go up the mountains and pick huckleberries, go camping. Those are just gone. And after the war, tried to go gather it again, you know, gather back together and start to, like where we left off before the war, so where we do things together, happiness, all that. It all changed. It's where everything changed, and a lot of them were gone. But it used to be so nice. Nevertheless, the ancient cultures of the Kootenai, Pondere, and Salish people survived in the post-war era. Many whites, though, wrongly imagined that throughout the region, the building of massive dams meant the end of Indian cultures. Net proceeds now become net profits, as once again red man bows before white man's march of progress. A river is harnessed, and the old order passeth. Contrary to this mythology, the people began to pick themselves up and fight back. Through the 60s and 70s, the tribal government began to develop a more powerful sense of its sovereignty and many of the young people took a renewed interest in the traditional culture and way of life. 
By the time the federal power license for Kurdam was up for renewal in 1980, the tribal council was ready to challenge the Montana Power Company for control of the dam. Um, when I think back to that time in my life when I was on the tribal council and we were negotiating with the Montana Power Company for control of the dam, um, the issue was like an obsession with me. I, it consumed my life. It was so very important to me to get control of the license, if not in this licensing period, then sometime in the future. We initially went for the license, and the response of the non-Indian was really unique because they had a fear, and the fear was that we would have the dam, the license, the money. And with the money comes that power. In the same way, that money would end the dependency that the tribes had, or it could at least lend to ending the dependency on the United States. And somehow the, that just brought fear into the non-Indian people around the reservation. In the meantime, tribal members organized an encampment at the dam site to express their opposition to the power company's continued control of the dam. Um, people were there guarding the site. Um, it was a, a sign of unity for tribal members. It was a, an expression of, of intent of the tribe's desires to control the, the license and to keep Montana Power Company off of it. But today, you young babies should be talking for your rights. Stood up and speak for your rights. Fight for your rights. The activists of 1984 were inspired in part by those tribal elders who still held vivid memories of their promises made and then broken by the power company in 1930. It has been decided that my people make this great development of your property, make use of this idle water for you and all who may be able to use its power. If it shall fall upon me to carry on this work, I ask that you send your young man to help me and that you come and set up your teepee and visit us when you can and watch the great work grow. It has brought enlightenment to us for prosperity for the future to come. We're supposed to get our lights free that time when we all signed up for so long. And the Kootenays people shake hands with, Mr. with our friend Frank M. Kerr. And here we are, adapting him as one of our tribes and people here for us. We shall know him as our Kashmukwai. He's a light. I thank you. We don't even own the dam. I can't even, we can't even get power from it. We have to buy it just like everybody else. That free power, what happened to it? That our elders were, that our elders talk about, what happened to it? Who got the free power? The history of the original deal was not forgotten, and so many tribal people in 1984 were outraged by the Bureau of Indian Affairs' lack of help to the tribes in trying to get the federal license to run the dam. I always ask this question to myself, and I would say, who in that Sam hell was the BIA? BIA is, uh, is a big joke. As far as I'm concerned. Um, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs did not provide any technical assistance or any sort of support for the tribes in pursuing the license. They didn't react fast enough. Um, it was like they were 10 years too slow in preparation for the issue. As the council becomes stronger and as the people on the council become more capable, 
Then what started to happen was the BIA was told what they would do rather than being asked what we should do. And that changed the whole relationship between this tribal government and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Part of the problem faced by the tribes was an old one for native people, the insensitivity of a federal agency, in this case, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC. It was the realities of the case where FERC didn't want to turn over to an Indian tribe a valuable resource such as uh, Kerr Dam, and I don't believe they understood that fully that it was tribal property to begin with. They took it as a, just another relicensing issue. Teresa Wall McDonald talks about the administrative judge who helped decide the Kerr Dam case. Um, I, I believe that the judge knew that we were in, a, in an extremely vulnerable position. Um, he, ha he knew how weak our case was. We, we couldn't provide any, any evidence of being able to retail the power at that point in time. Um, but I don't think that he understood the history or, or how difficult it had been, nor did he understand the bitterness on some of the tribal members. The final settlement did not give the Confederated tribes what they wanted, immediate control of the dam. But they did get a rental fee for the dam site of $9 million per year for 30 years. And then in the year 2015, the tribes would take direct control of the dam itself. There are still mixed feelings within the tribe over the terms of the deal. Some think the tribes should have aimed for only as much money as they could get, while others believe that tribal control of the dam in itself was just as important. Most of the council felt, or I think, I'm not going to say most of them, a lot of the council felt that their best, their obligation was to get the best deal for the tribes, the most monetary return for the tribes, whether it was through relicensing re the dam to Montana Power or some other entity or getting the license in their own name. The bottom line was how much can we make off of it. One of the things that came out of the negotiations with Montana Power Company is that we had an element of people that were very unhappy because what they wanted was money, cash, right now. And to me, this is an indication of the lack of tribalism. And maybe it's an indication of the success of the Bureau and of the government to assimilate people. But the whole concept that there's the money, I want it right now, I don't care about the generations to come, that is totally against tribalism because what you always do as a leader especially is consider what's not only good right now, what will be good for the future, for the future generations. We can say re really today did we do enough? Did we do the right things? Did the council do the right things? I know they did one thing. They went and they put their best foot forward, you know. They, they tried to negotiate in the best of faith. But today, as I look back at it, they were trying to negotiate with, with the man with the stack deck. Very simple, very simple. Those are the things that we're going to have to make sure that they are doing today. They live up to their obligations. They never lived up to the first ones. And if that's what you're going to get, then do the, do the, do the things that we didn't do, which was send that sucker down the goddamn river in little pieces. Kudam today produces an estimated $50 million per year for the Montana Power Company. In the year 2015, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes will control this money. After a century of acculturation, the people will have a new kind of power to determine their cultural direction, to choose our own way of life. But the history here, a history that includes the construction of Kerr Dam, has left divisions within the tribes over what our future direction should be. The question now looms as to whether tribalism can or should be revitalized as the actual living way of life of the people. There's a lot of different things that we're trying to 
encourage the young people to come back to the old Indian ways of living. Well, that's pretty much socialistic, and I don't think either one of the tribes would go along with it. Uh, I think they're pretty, they they're, uh, celebrate their traditional culture uh, individually, uh, which is fine, but I don't think you'll ever get them to the point where the, It'll be, everything will be share and share alike. They're too capitalistic to do that. Uh, a strict tribal community was very socialistic, and I don't think we're headed that direction. There's a lot of ways that uh, our cord uh, money could be used. But uh, the half breeds, they don't look at it that way. They want to put their money in where they'll get their money back and then to make, to make money. It's got to be in the concept of everybody together. And some people say, oh, that's a crock, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's dead only in their minds. It's not dead in the minds of the youth. Myself, with the, with the sweats and uh, the traditional doings that we have and stuff, it, it kept me in line, you know, it kept me on a on a good road where I learn and I respect what what they do, you know, with the sweat house and with our creator. I take these things that I learn in my everyday life to uh, res respect the the way that I was taught, you know, with the sweat and stuff to lead a good life, you know, to not to take things for granted. Whether for good or for bad, tribal control of Kurdam will bring great changes to the Flathead Reservation. Can this resource be used in ways that will nurture the native cultures? Or will this money only lead the people to adopt more completely the values and way of life of the non-Indian society? There's nothing we can do, I think, about uh, taking away Kurdam or you know, getting rid of it. It's there and it's going to be there for a while, and you might as well make good use of it. Uh, but I, I don't want to see that become a primary source of, uh, or a primary focus for our people. You know, then we lose focus of ourselves again. How much should we develop? Um, how, much, how much can the land stand? How much, how much can the culture stand? We've got to go the way of the Indian. We've got to go the way that preserves the integrity of what we are. We're not, we're not brown-skinned people who happen to live along Highway 93. You know, we're the Salish and Kootenai people. Uh, if we ignore our culture, if we let uh, other cultures dominate, then our culture will die, will fade away, and we will no longer be uh, a, a people, an Indian people. We'll be known as, a, as a, just a race of people, but they won't know who, what to label us because we have no more culture. How many people uh, 30 years old, Kootenai and Salish, can, can stand in a bunch together and converse in their language. How many Kootenai and Salish 20-year-olds can stand together and say, this is, uh, this is the way my ancestors uh, conduct a certain ceremony? How many Salish and Kootenai kids can you take and give them a drum and tell them to sing? There, there, there's not too many, and not enough. We have to wake up. We have to wake up and see that, that let it come to life again. Let it live again. For some elders, the dams that have been built are themselves part of a way of life that must be changed. So there are questions as to whether these monuments to the domination of nature 
can ever be used to help restore the traditional way of life. No, that's why I was thinking. But it's soon we were all gone. White man, he didn't know what he doing. Make a dam, a dam all over. You know what's going to happen to us? Just to once, it's busted all dam, that dam. The water coming out. Water kill us. Lightning come up there, that water get burned. That's what's happened. It's going to happen to us. That's what I always think of myself. Getting bad. White people is getting too far. Tribal control of Kerr Dam is both a power and a burden, but it has given both young and old the chance to offer their dreams for the future. When I like to see the old ways come back. Because nowadays it's going too far the other way. Long time, the old injured way is what we should do. But pretty hard, I guess. We can do it. Uh, language can be revived. Uh, culture can be practiced, not exactly the way it was done two, three hundred years ago, but I think it can be practiced and it can be done. So the heritage will continue. Ironically, a dam which helped destroy tribal culture may now be used to restore it. And that's how we should keep on using the Kurd dam money to be more in the Indian ways, to use it in the Indian ways. It took money to destroy it. It's probably going to take money to revive it again. And I, I think uh, we're, a, we're a smart enough tribe to do it. If we stay fair and just with the people. But mainly I'd like to see the tribes purchase as much of the land back and gain control of it and possibly go into Aboriginal territory and start purchasing land. So hopefully that may, my dream is someday the Kootenai, the Flatheads will own all of Western Montana. Well, I think one of the major uses of that money should be for education. We have to be able to teach our children to live in two worlds. That's a fine balance, but they, they've got to know who they are and where they came from. That's the security of the, the people. But they also have to know how to live in this new world and use the technology of the new world. That money can be used there. Today, the native people of the Flathead Reservation are dreaming their future. They are dreaming a future they now have the power to create, if Kurdam can be used in this way. Until now, the dam has been a part of the loss of Native American sovereignty and culture. But depending on how it is used, it may now become a tool of regeneration and hope. Well, a hundred years from now, I'd like this reservation to look like it did a hundred years ago. I'd like it to be one place in this world that's still as pristine as possible. And it's a all together. It's the people and the state of mind of the people that we have to preserve. We have to preserve our natural existence. <laughs> Which, such an slim to wits to melt. 
A hundred years from now, I can go up to one of my grandkids, or somebody can go up to one of my grandkids and say, Who are you? Uh, they can say, Tachnao Nini, Tunacha, or they can say, Tachnao Nini, Kanukhlaatlam. Hunini Akhtmaknik. That's what I'd like to, the, to see. I'd like to see him say, Nasnini Kamak, this is my land. And another hundred years from there, there'll still be a person say, Tachnao Nini Akhtmaknik. Nasnini Kamak, Nini Akhtmaknik. There's been two many people born, or we're having a trouble now, there's too much people. Should the Indians stop making kids? <laughs> that I wouldn't know. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, they haven't been important. The uh, only thing that's been important to me is, uh, is making money in America and flying my flag every 4th of July. <laughs> no. <laughs> OK. Are you ready to go? Yeah. <laughs> you got it on now? Oh no! <laughs>